I would like to thank uh, Professor Reber and Professor Huber and Tobias uh, for the kind invitation to participate in this session. <coughs> Much progress has been made in our knowledge of the centuries of Euvia as a result of the archaeological field work and the study of finds carried out during the last decades by a wide number of scholars and institutions. The available evidence shows that every century constitutes a complex and changing microcosmos where different multifaceted practices took place. Actually, the location, the inception, and the development of the Euvian centuries cannot be explained without taking into account the special geographic position and feature of Euvia, the wide range of the island, island's economic activities, the social changes that occurred during the first millennium BC, and the turbulent political history of the insular polis. In this respect, the Eurasian sanctuaries are especially instructive. Yet, there were many other important sanctuaries in Euvia. Dr. Reber has already mentioned some of them in his lecture. Sadly, most have not yet been extensively excavated. Let me turn to the analysis of existing data regarding one of these Euvian sanctuaries and share with you some reflection and hypothesis. I will focus on the sanctuary of Artemis, which was situated, according to Herodotus, in a coastal region of northern Euvia called Artemision. Herodotus also tells us that Artemision was controlled by Istia. From his testimony, we can deduce that the area had taken on its name had taken on its name because of the importance of the cult and the shrine. We can also infer that the inception of both cult and shrine may date back at least to the archaic period. The location of the sanctuary was identified in the 1880s by Lolin at the hill of Ayos Georgios near the modern village of Pefgi, i.e. in a liminal position on the east edge of the plain of Sirius River, west of the Brisas Brook, and close to the shore. The German archaeologists carried out limited excavation at the site, which was still surrounded by a forest and last vegetation at the close of the 19th century. Lolling brought to light a good number of finds, including two inscriptions, several archi architectural members, as well as a few pieces of sculptures. Sadly, most of these artifacts are lost. And nowadays, a small church and a cemetery stand on the hilltop. <laughs> An epigram engraved on a marble block which was discovered at Megara constitutes the earliest reference to the sanctuary. The inscription dates to the 4th or 5th century AD, by the text, but the text is attributed to Simonides by most scholars. The epigram states that the Euvian Temenos shrine was dedicated to Agni, or Agne, the pure, the chase, and Toxophoros, the arch bearer, Artemis. The epithets refer to Artemis' role as protectress of wildlife, mistress of the animals, and goddess of hunting. It should be noted that both titles, Agni and Toxophoros, are consistent with the previously mentioned hilly, forested, and liminal location of the sanctuary. As we will see next, later evidence confirms that the epithet used by Simonides are not mere literary devices. On the contrary, they may well reflect the actual traits of the cult. The testimony of Simonides, along with the location of, of the shrine, suggests that the sanctuary could have served as a common meeting place for the neighboring agrarian, pastoral, 
and hunter-gatherer communities. Uh, we could further suppose that the goddess could have been honored with the first fruit of the land, as sees Agni, as well as the sacrifice of domesticated or wild animals. She could also have been the recipient of other humble offerings evocative of the economical activities carried out by these populations. For example, axes, arrowheads, and spears, as well as clay and metal figurines representing humans, shepherds, uh, and animals. In ancient Greece, the epithet Agni, Agne, pure chase, was also connected with the role of Artemis as the goddess who presided over the transition of females from childhood to marriage. I will return to this point later. The sanctuary probably gained, gained widespread popularity after the sea battle of Athenation, which was held in 480 BC between Xerxes Navy and a coalition of Greek naval forces. Actually, classical, Hellenistic, and Roman poetry has been detected on surface during recent field surveys at Ayos Georgios Hill. Lorin maintained that some architectural members he recovered during the excavation, his excavations, could have belonged to a small classical temple. Yet, the hypothesis of Lorin concerning the existence of a classical temple in the sanctuary of Artemis pushes puzzling question. Should we suppose that the edifice was erected by the Istian between 480 and 446 BC as a part of build, uh, build, building program which followed the Persian devastation of their territory? Or was it constructed between 446 and 405 BC, i.e. during the period in which the Athenians expelled the Istians from their territory and then settled 1,000 to 2,000 lot owners there? Or could the temple have been built after the Peloponnesian War when the Istians recovered their territory and were ruled by successive politics of different affiliation. Changes affecting the demographic composition of, lo of the local population, as well as stasis, i.e. civil strife, could have led to respective changes in religious practices. A fourth or third, a third century BC inscription found by Lolin at Ayers Georgios Hill seems to attest to the worship worship of Artemis in the Hellenistic period as Parthenos, virgin maiden, and Agrotera, the goddess of the fields and hunting. These two titles are almost synonyms with the epithets Acne and Toxophoros mentioned by the Simonidian epigram. Thus, we can assume that Artemis continued to be honor as an agricultural deity who guaranteed the fertility of the fields and flocks, but also as a nurturing goddess who protected young people in their transition from childhood to adulthood, as well as in the process of social integration in their communities. All over Greece, Artemis was believed to preside over fights of, fights of passage that included temporary segregation of the participants in front of sanctuaries located in the wild. Artemis Abrotera was widely worshipped, and especially in Athens and Sparta. In both Athens and Sparta, Artemis Abrotera was considered a virginal huntress, but also a warlike deity. We don't know if the cult of Artemis Agrotera Artemision had a similar twofold nature. However, 
the sea battle against Xerxes' armada and the later presence of Athenians and Sparta at Istia could have led to the assignment of new trades to her cult. If this was the case, then it's, it would seem likely that the visitors of the sanctuary would have consecrated swords, seals, and helmets to the goddess, along with the aforementioned spies, spears and arrowheads. In fact, the Euvian inscription also contains a mention to Pyrrhic dances. Nevertheless, the fragmentary state of the inscription prevents us from, determ from determining beyond any doubt whether these warlike dances were performed in the very sanctuary of Artemis at that mission or elsewhere. If indeed the public dances occur at Artemision, then we can infer that Artemis, that Artemis was also regarded as a war goddess by the Stians. Furthermore, we could assume that the reign had become not only a meeting point, but also a rallying point where civic festival, accompanied by games, were celebrated. On the other hand, we cannot exclude the possibility that the inscription could have been the subtle dedication of Aestean, who performed the Pyrrhic dances in other places and later decided to put into writing his accomplishment at the Aestean Artemisio. That being the case, then the inscription constitutes a clear example of private self-propaganda. In order to achieve renown among his peers, the dedicator, the dedicator deliberately chose a famous and well-visited shrine as place, as place for display of his outstanding act. At Agios Georgios Hill, Lorin found another interesting inscription. The document dates to the second, first century BC. It records a a list of private donators who contributed different amounts of money to the restoration of the sanctuary of Artemis, as well as, the, as to the construction of eight sculpture. This sculpture most likely representing the goddess. In this document, the goddess is mentioned with the epithet Procyoa, i.e. Artemis who dwells or faces is what or toward, towards the dawn. The title could refer to the goddess concern for safeguarding the local communities for external threats. Mm -hmm. In the first second century AD, Plutarch provides a, con a condensed description of the shrine. He states that the cult place, the, the cult place was indeed dedicated to Artemis Procyoa, as we saw before. The writer also reports that there was a modest temple in the sanctuary. He also mentioned a circle of white slabs that had been erected on the ground. Therefore, he corro corroborates that investment occurred both in facilities and dedications. Plutarch also affirmed that the temple was surrounded by a grove which records the relationship between Artemis and the wilds. Plutarch stated that one of the slabs in the sanctuary showed the inscription that you can see in the slide above. The inscription constitute a clear case of Athenian state propaganda containing a distortional view of the historical events. The text claims that the Athenians were the only Greek fighting the Persian armada. It also attributes the victory to Athens. The date of the setting up of the slabs is a vexed question. Here I will only highlight that the inscription mentions 
Artemis as Parthenos, virgin maiden, a title that also appears in the early Hellenistic inscription we saw before 1190. As we have said, Artemis Parthenos was regarded as all over ancient Greece as the protectress of children as, as the, as, and as the goddess who kept watch over the rites through which the young acceded to the adulthood. Plutarch briefly states that the white slabs, when rubbed, gave off the color and the fragrance of saffron. The writer provides no further details on the issue. However, he was certainly well aware of the multiple of the multiple connotation of the offerings of the offering. Indeed, the choice of such a bizarre stone was not accidental. We can told, we are told that the stone was white, which is consistent with the virginal character of Artemis but it was also susceptible of physical changes, i.e. to transitions. Besides the display of stone slabs that could acquire the color of saffron in the century of Artemis Procyoa, i.e. the Artemis who faces the dawn, would, would seem appropriate. For Eos, the personification of dawn, was usually described as the saffron trope. Actually, both literary and epigraphical rec uh, records reflect that saffron robes were used by all kinds of females, whether they were goddess, muses, nymphs, heroines, or mortals. It is worth noting that Iphigenia was wearing a saffron robe when she was about to be sacrificed at the sanctuary at, uh, of Artemis in Aulis. But uh, she was finally re uh, replaced in the altar by a deer. Moreover, saffron garments are consecrated, were so, uh, consecrated to Artemis Bravoronia. Bravoronia. Saffron was also used in the elaboration of perfumes for women and again, <clears throat> saffron was used for preparation for the preparation of medicine that promoted conception and procreation. All these data are consistent with the role of Artemis as the protectress of the feminine gender. To sum up, the sanctuary of Artemis at Artemision was situated, was situated at a liminal position, i.e. in a point of contact with the wildness and other threats, including the Persian. The sanctuary was the venue where gathering, gathering occurred, offerings were consecrated, personal and state propaganda was displayed, and possibly rates of passage were celebrated. And here, Artemis was worshipped as a goddess of the wild, but also as a beneficent deity. Thank you very much. <clears throat>